Well, thanks for being here. Glad you're here. Chris mentioned earlier that uh, our high schoolers that are leaving from each retreat, they're probably loading the buses right now and heading out. And uh, so we missed them in the room. They were packed in the room the first hour. I think there's something like, I think it's 310 we have going. And uh, so you pray for them this week. We'll tell you more about that at the end of the service. Um, We're wrapping up Romans 8 today. I want to start it a little different way. Um, A long time ago, many years ago, um, Serena Williams was playing the first match of the U.S. Open tennis tournament, and she was playing Francesca Schiavone, who is an Italian player, who was no slouch. She rose all the way to number four in the, in, the, in the world rankings at one time. But Serena Williams was just too much for her. She was absolutely taking Schiavone apart. Just not only was she, Schiavone having trouble winning games, she was having trouble even winning points. And uh, there was a point in the match when Serena Williams hit a ball down the line for another winner. And Shivani is just so exasperated and she just, and she walked back toward the baseline and the ball boy came toward her to give her some more balls for the next set of service. Watch this very short video and watch what happens. This is why she's so popular. <laughs> ball, oh. ball guys confused. <laughs> <laughs> but yet another break point. Do you see him start to back away and she goes, no, 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 come here. I, I don't need a tennis ball, I need a hug. She's getting blitzed. And, and in a very real sense, sometimes life makes us feel that way. We're getting absolutely hammered. We're getting crushed by the circumstances of life. And we need a hug. <laughs> we, need to, we need to know that someone is there, that someone cares, that someone is in our corner, if you will, that someone is for us. And Paul has been showing us that all along in Romans chapter 8, that there is someone who is there for us, that there is someone who is there that loves us and will always love us, and nothing can change his love for us. That's what Romans 8 shows us, and it shows us, and it gives us the great security and assurance that we have if we are in Christ Jesus, if we've placed our faith in him and we know him as our Lord and as our Savior. I want to do a real quick review, and then we're going to wrap up Romans 8. We conclude it today, and this will be very simple. It'll be somewhat of a repeat in that what he says in these final two verses, he's kind of been saying, but he says it in a different way. So hang in there with me, and I just pray that God will encourage your heart and your life with these two verses. But remember, we're closing, this, we're closing Romans 8 with this great rhetorical section that Paul has. It begins in verse 31, and, and he asks, if God is for us, or he asks, I should say, what shall we say to these things? What things? To all the things that have come before. And then he asks these five rhetorical questions. They're questions that are unanswerable. They're not really so much questions. They're statements. They're doctrinal truths that he's laying out before us. And these truths give us great hope. Here was the first question is, if God is for us, who is against us? And what's the answer to that? Remember, if God is for us, who's against us? Yeah, nobody, no one, however you want to say it. Nobody. If God is for you, who can possibly be against you? And then the second question was, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Remember, this is the argument from the greater to the lesser. Since God has given us the greatest gift possible in his son, which he has, the greatest gift imaginable, sending the son of God, Jesus, to come and die in our place and shed his blood for my sin, for your sins, so we could have life, what gift could possibly be bigger? than the Son of God dying in your place. And since that is true, since he's given us the greatest gift, won't he give us everything else we need to become the people he wants us to become? And the answer is clearly, yes, he will. If he's given us the greatest, certainly he'll provide everything else we need in life to be the people he would want us to be. And then the third question was this, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justified. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Now, let me be more specific. Remember when we talked about this, uh, there's a, probably another way I can ask that question because there are a lot of people, and we saw this in the passages, a lot of people can bring a charge against us, the God's children. A lot can charge us or try to. The question is, who can bring a charge against us and make it stick? And the answer is nobody. nobody. Why? He, said, he tells us right here, who will bring a charge against God's like God is the one who justifies So God himself is the one who justifies us. Let me say it this way. God is the one who makes us right with God himself. So if God makes us right with God, who on earth or anywhere else can 
bring a charge against us and make it stick when the God is the one that's made us right with himself in the first place. And clearly there's no answer to that because no one can. And then he asks, who is the one who condemns? He's left the charge, now it's who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who is the one who condemns? And again, the answer is nobody. Why? Because he tells us here, because Christ is the one who died. Because Jesus came and took our sin upon himself and died in our place. And then the next phrase says, and was raised from the dead. He was raised. What does that mean? Remember, it means that God accepted his sacrifice. If Jesus were not who he said, it, said he was, if he was not the son of God, if God did not accept the perfect sacrifice of Jesus for us, God would not have raised him from the dead. That's God's seal of approval. But yes, this is my son and he died in your place. He died, he was raised. He's at the right hand of the father. He has ascended to the throne of God. He's at the right hand of the father in that position of authority. And the next phrase says he intercedes for us. He's there praying for you this morning if you're his child. Is that not great news? And so who can condemn us If Jesus Christ has died for us, if he was raised for us, if he's at the right hand of the Father and interceding for us, and the answer is nobody. Nobody can condemn us. And then he asked that last question we saw last time, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who can possibly separate us from the love of Christ? And he mentioned some some things that would try to separate us from the love of Christ. Remember, he mentions tribulation. Well, tribulation separates us from the love of Christ. Remember, tribulation means some weightiness, some weighty thing that's pushing down on us. Can that separate us from the love of Christ? No. And then he asks, well, distress. Remember, that means the narrowing in of the walls, if you will, being hemmed in. Is there something in life that can hem you in and separate you from the love of Christ? And the answer is no. And then he says persecution. Can someone chase you down because you're a believer and persecute you with the intention of doing you harm and separate you from the love of Christ? And the answer is no. And then he asks, well, nakedness, well, having nothing, well, famine, well, having nothing to eat and the great pain of that, will it cause it? Well, peril or danger is what it means. Will danger separate you from the love of Christ? He says no, and Paul dealt with that in his own life and talked about it in his own life. And then he said, well, the sword, will someone coming and killing you because you're a Christian separate you from the love of Christ? And he says, no, cannot do it. And then he says, For your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But while that's true, no one, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And then we saw the last verse last time. He says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Remember, we're super conquerors. As his children, we don't just win, but we win going away. We don't win in extra innings. It's not even close. We win a huge win because we're super conquerors. Why? Here's why we're super conquerors. I didn't say this last time. But we're super conquerors because the battle we win is in and for eternity. We're not just winning a little battle where you gain something on planet Earth and you get a little more land or you get a little more possessions or you get some. No, we're winning this battle in and for eternity. And nothing will rob us of this victory we have in Christ. And so Paul's built this entire case in this last rhetorical close of why we can be secure at and be assured in our relationship with God in Christ that nothing will change it. Remember, he says, I hold my sheep in my hand and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Now, Paul's built this evidence upon evidence and he's such a rational thinker and such a wonderful teacher and he's building this case and he's built case after case after case where why we should believe this is true like those five rhetorical questions we just looked at. We need people to be able to do that. You need to be able to have an apologetic argument in the world we live in where people wonder if there even is such a thing as truth. So we need to be able to stack truth upon truth so we can, as Josh McDowell said a long time ago, present evidence in such a way that it demands a verdict from other people. That we we can present the case of Christ in such a clear way that people have to give it thought and have to give it at least a look to say, could this be true? But there comes a time in our relationships and our sharing and our apologetic discourse, if you will, and building truth upon truth, there comes a time, though, when it becomes time to say, this is what I believe. This is the difference that's made in my life. When somebody says, okay, I hear the truth, I hear what you're presenting and building there, but what about you? What difference has it made in your life? What's it mean to you? In other words, it's time for a testimony. And in a sense, that's what Paul does in these last two verses. Listen to the two verses and listen especially to how it starts in the first four words. He says, for I am convinced. In other words, this is my testimony. 
I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul says, I am convinced. That word convinced means fully and absolutely persuaded on the basis of evidence that cannot be denied. Fully and absolutely persuaded on the basis of evidence that can't be denied. He says, here's the truth, and he stacked it up for us, and he said, I'm fully fully persuaded. And you look at his life, and you see it clearly in his life because he's laid his whole life out there based on this truth, and he's betting on the truth of God in Jesus Christ that his love can never be taken away from us. That's what he's saying. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way about Paul. He says, Paul has come through a process of persuasion to a settled conclusion because of the evidence God has put before him over time. The tense of the word means I have become convinced and I remain convinced. Paul says, I'm convinced. Now, he's not convinced that his situation and life is going to change. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying because I'm a believer and I've trusted in Christ that everything's going to be great and all the situations of life are going to change to be what I want them to be. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is because of my commitment to Christ and because I know him, nothing can change his love toward me no matter what comes my way. And last week, he gave us seven of those things. I mentioned them a minute ago. Tribulation and distress and persecution and those seven things. Now he's going to add 10 more things in his testimony, 10 more things that cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ toward us who are his children. He's going to give them to us. There's four sets of two that go together that are kind of opposites. And then there's two standalones. And we'll, and we'll look at them and just kind of walk through them. So we read them in the verses a minute ago. So he begins his testimony with the first pair. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. Now, it's great he begins with death because, because think about death. Death is the great separator. He's talking about being separated from the love of God in Christ. Death is clearly the great separator, right? It separates us from everything on this planet. It separates us from our loved ones, It separates us from uh, our friends, our acquaintances, our job, our hobbies. It separates us from everything we experience in this life. And so clearly death is the great separator, and so we understand that. But death also is the thing that probably brings people in life the most fear they'll ever face. People are scared of death. What happens when I die? Where do I go when I die? Do I continue to exist? Do I go into nothingness? And if you don't know and believe God's word, you really don't know. In fact, Hebrews 2.15 speaks of those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Francis Bacon said, men fear death as children fear darkness. And apart from Christ, there's no hope for that fear of death or the separation of death. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Listen, those are the person, those are the words of the person, the only one who ever lived, who rose from the dead. And that new body never to die again. He defeated death. And that's why Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Is he saying that you and I, if we're believers, will never die physically? No, it's not what he's saying. He's saying when we die physically, we go immediately to bring it, be in his presence though. Life goes on. In fact, Paul's going to say in Philippians later, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. (laughs) He said, in fact, for the believer, to die is gain because death can't separate us. Death can't separate us from the love of God in Christ. And then the opposite, I guess, the other end of the spectrum is life. Life can't separate us from the love of God in Christ. It doesn't matter what goes on in your life, what kind of decisions you make, what experience you have on this planet, nothing in life, life can separate us from all sorts of things. In life, we can be separated in marriages, we can be separated in friendships, we can be separated from business partners, we can be separated from all sorts of things. But life and nothing that happens in life can separate us, he says, from the love of God in Christ. Now, look at those two things and you think about them. That, That really includes everything, doesn't it? I mean, death can't separate us from the love of God in Christ, and nothing in life can separate us from the love of God in Christ, then what is there that can possibly separate us from the love of God in Christ? 
And the answer is nothing. I mean, really, Paul covers it all right there. And I think he could stop right there, but Paul's a lot better teacher than me, so Paul doesn't stop right there. And he goes on and he says, nor angels, nor principalities. Now, the idea here is, is that he's talking about spirit beings with the small s, and he's saying angels can't separate you from the love of Christ. And not only that, the, the principalities there is probably referring to that third of angels who rebelled with, with Lucifer and were cast out of heaven, and, and they rebelled, and they're... Their heart is not towards you. Their heart is not toward the kingdom of God. And they're out to deceive and to destroy. And God says through Paul in Romans 8, the principalities can't separate you from the love of God in Christ either. You're his child. Angels can't separate you from the love of God, love of God in Christ, nor can principalities separate you from the love of God in Christ. And then he continues. He says, nor are things present, nor are things to come. So he's dealt with life and death. He's dealt with principalities, both good and bad. And now he says, even time can't separate you. The present can't, neither can things to come. One, one, one commentator said, time is powerless against believers. Think about that. Time is powerless against believers. There is nothing going on in your life right now is what Paul is saying. No matter what you're facing today, if you're, if you're in Jesus Christ, you've placed your faith in him, there is nothing happening in your life today, no matter how difficult it seems, that can separate you from the love of God in Christ, for Christ's love for you. That's amazing. But he also says there's nothing coming down the pike that can either. No things nor things to come. There is nothing over the horizon of your life that you cannot see that's going to separate you from the love of God in Christ. There may be some horrible things for all of us over the horizon. We don't know. I don't know. But what I do know about the things over the horizon, if you're in Christ today, whatever those things are, they cannot separate you from God's love for you in his son, Jesus Christ. And that's really good news. That's what he's saying to us. Nothing can, no matter what you're going to face. And, and, then, he, and then he comes to the first of the standalones. That's three pairs. And then he comes to the next word, and he says, nor powers. And then there's some debate about what this means. Some, some, think, that, some think it means, some commentators think it means like, uh, political powers that could keep you from worshiping freely. I, I don't think that's the idea here. Uh, that, that would be like what happened to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't think that's the word here. I, I think this word is more of a summary of those three things he just talked about. The death, the life, the today, the tomorrow, all of those things, the angels, the principalities, none of those came, and then he just adds to it, our powers. None of those powers can separate you from the love of God in Christ and his love towards you. None of those things can do it. And then he adds the third pair. He says, nor height nor depth. So now he goes to the realm of space. And he says, you go as high as you want to go in the universe. Go as high as you want. It doesn't matter how high you go. Nothing in height can separate you from God's love for you in Jesus Christ. Or you go to the depths. You go as low as you want to go. And there's nothing there that can separate you from the love of God. In Jesus Christ. It doesn't always feel like God's love is there. You know that's true if you've lived life very long, but the reality is you can't go anywhere where his love is not there for you. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 7. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. There is nothing in the heavens above. There's nothing to hell below. For those that are in Christ Jesus, they can separate you from God's love for you. And so just look at all those things. Look at them. Not death, not life, not angels, not principalities, not things present, not things to come, not powers, not height, not depth. Now, just in case you might be a creative thinker and you can think of something that Paul hasn't covered in there. Paul's got you covered. Because he adds one more standalone, and then he follows. He says, nor any other created thing. Nor any other created thing. He says, there is no other created thing. And by the way, just you're thinking, in case you're thinking, that, well, maybe there's something that's not created that can do it. No, because you go read John chapter 1, and it tells you that, that Christ created all things, and there's nothing been made, been made that hasn't been made by him nor any other created thing. It's the catch-all. He says, just in case you think there's something, I want you to know that there is nothing, that if you're in Christ, you've placed your faith in him and you know him, he's taken up residence in your life, that there is nothing anywhere on this planet, in the other planet, in the heavens above, 
hell below, anywhere in between, today, tomorrow, the future, death, life, or anywhere else can separate you and me from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Some of you might be thinking, yeah, but what about me? What if I separate myself from the love of God in Christ? What if I've made so many decisions in my life, I've gone my own way and done my own thing outside of God's will and I've sinned against him? Could that make God stop loving me? When bad stuff happens on the inside, we think that way sometimes, but he's saying no. You can't even separate yourself from God's love. I'm not saying there aren't consequences to our decisions. We've talked about that throughout this series. But if you're in Christ today, you can't separate yourself from him. He loves you, and he will always love you. And some of you might be thinking, what about things outside of me? What about things that are happening around me that I had no control over that clearly God can't love me to allow these things to have happened in my life? But no matter how much of a mess life seems to be on the outside, he says, no, I'm there with you wherever you go. I read you that verse a moment ago. You can't go anywhere where I'm not there with you. My love is there with you. Nothing, anywhere, anytime, any place, by anyone, look on the screen, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Look at that. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, look at that word, kind of toward the front. I want to point it out again. I pointed out a couple of weeks ago the word us. Who's he talking about? He's talking about all the way back to verse one of Romans eight, for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who have come to Jesus Christ and placed their faith in him, trusted in him and what he's done on your behalf on the cross, shedding his blood for your sin, and putting your full weight upon him and trusting him to give you life, forgive you of your sin. Turning away from your old life and turning to him and trusting him. He will never leave you. He will never stop loving you. That's why this chapter, and we started the series calling this chapter the goat, the greatest of all time. Think about the chapter. It's been amazing. The chapter began, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, remember? I mean, that means you're in Christ today. There, there's no condemnation for you. Not yesterday, not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not in eternity, never. There's no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. And it ends with no separation. We've talked about it all morning this morning, that there's no chance for condemnation for you in Christ, and there's no chance that you'd ever be separated from Christ's love. Is that not amazing? No condemnation, no separation. And in between, we learn some amazing things. We learn that the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. We, we could never measure up to the law. Remember why? Because of the weakness of our flesh. So Christ did it for us. And the spirit of life in Christ, that means he's come and taken up residence in us and given us his righteousness. We didn't earn it or deserve it, but he's given it to us because of his great love for us. And we have life. And remember, we, we, we learned we were adopted by him. We've become his children. All this in this chapter, we've become his children. And not only are we his children, we're co-heirs with Christ. We're going we're gonna to inherit glory with him. We have, we're assured of glory in God's presence. Is that amazing? And in the meantime, he says, you don't have to be a slave to the flesh anymore, but now you should just walk in the spirit and let God lead you and guide you in this. And God is in the process of doing this. And remember what we learned. And we hit that one verse. We talked about that one verse that we talk about and people quote it all the time, but we saw it in the proper context in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. There's no condemnation, there's no separation, and in between, God is at work in my life and your life, if you know him, building into us and making us the people he wants us to be, and he's taking all the events of life, he doesn't cause all the events of life, but he takes all the events of life, both good and bad, and he works them for good in the lives of those that love him. Why? Remember the next verse? in order to conform us to the image of Christ to make you and me more like Jesus. Now think about this. That's what God is doing in your life. That's why this chapter is so amazing. And then after we get through that section, we get to the end and we see all these promises that nothing's gonna separate us from these truths. Is that not amazing? That's what, if you're in Christ today, that's what God is doing in your life. And the reality of the truths we've learned in this chapter 
I pray sink deep into our souls and begin to change how we look at life and how we live life because we know God is at work in us, making us more like Christ. Is that not amazing? That's the reality. And so Paul ends Romans 8 with a testimony, his testimony. He says, I'm convinced that death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor the present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I want to end our study of Romans 8 with a personal testimony too. Not mine, somebody else's. About 10 years ago, actually just a little bit over 10 years ago now, we used to have our guest reception right out those doors across the hall, across the lobby, and we, at that time we call it the parlor. And one Sunday, the service was over, I walked back to go see if we had any guests there to meet them, and I walked in and one of our volunteers says, there's a lady back over in that back corner and she needs to talk to you. And I headed back that way and this lady had two little girls with her. Like I said, this is a little over 10 years ago, two little girls, cute little girls with her. She was sitting on one of the little couches that was in the room, her little girl's next to her, and I pulled up a chair in front of her and began to talk to her. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll call her Mary for the sake of the story. And I said, ask her, Mary, how can I help you today? And she began to share her story. Two little girls, the week before her husband had walked out on her. She had nothing, no relatives in Houston. She's from, a, I won't tell you where, but a city somewhere in one of the northern states. And she was distraught. You can imagine, and one of the volunteers helped me with the little girls, as she sobbed and told me her story of how she had put her husband through college, put him through a grad school for a, prepare him for a professional, very professional profession, if you will. And with the two little girls and all that time, she had no plan B and he left her for someone else. Do you think she felt loved in that moment? Do you think she felt the love of God in that moment? Certainly not. She was crushed. The circumstances of life were pushing down on her and she was perplexed. I talked to her. I talked to my wife, Josie, about her. Josie was teaching a young mom's class at that time here and she invited her to come to it and some of the other ladies, and this is, by the way, this is a testimony for our church family. Some of those ladies in that class and some other ladies in the church that got to know her came alongside of her. A couple of them in particular poured into her. She stayed in Houston about another six months, took a class, she developed a plan. She moved back to the north where her parents said, come stay with us for a while until you're on your feet. So she and her two little girls went back to the city where she was from with her, with her folks. Josie and I talked to her last week for a long time. It was a great call. It was so cool. And what precipitated the call was Josie had seen on Facebook that the oldest little girl graduated from high school this week, or last week. And it was so cool. Now, I won't go into all the details, but her, the picture on the little car as she drove by and the little parade thing was very clear that she was open about her faith. And so as I talked to this woman, we're gonna call Mary. We talked about that day. She refreshed my memory about that day. And then she said this. She said, you know, I didn't know how God was working. She said, there were times, she said, we had our electricity cut off and she talked about some of the things they went through through the years. She went back, even after all that, she went back home. She got her degree. I think she even got her CPA. She has a good job. She's left her parents' home. She and her daughters now live in their own house. Her daughter just graduated and will start Hillsdale College next year. This oldest daughter sold out to Jesus Christ in the public high school there in the town that is certainly not in the Bible Belt, taught a, taught a Bible study three days a week at her high, public high school in the city where they are. She's leaving for college. The little sister's plan is to step in and begin teaching the Bible study this year as she's in high school. And this lady said to me, if that had not happened in my life, we were just floating along through life, just doing our thing, and she said, but when that happened in my life, it turned my attention to God and he got a hold of my life and it changed me. And she quoted Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And she began a journey with God that she had never known before and her daughters came to know him and have a journey with him today. And that's how God works in our lives. 
Things, doesn't mean things are gonna be easy. Do you think it was easy when electricity was cut off? Do you think it was easy that day when she was brokenhearted in that room? Certainly not. But understand, do you see that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Not even the most extreme moments in life. Understand that God is at work. If you're in Christ today, he is at work in your life, even when you can't see it, conforming you to the image of his son. And that's really, really, really good news for all of us in Christ. No condemnation, no separation, and in between, God is at work, making us into the people he wants us to be. Is that amazing? That God loves you that much, and God is at work in your life. Now, let me just say a word again and remind you, this is for those who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ and begun this journey. God invites you to. God invites you to come to him, open your heart to him, and place your faith in Jesus. He went to the cross for you, and he paid for you. You say, well, you don't know what my life's like. My life is so messed up. Perfect. You're the perfect candidate. You can join the rest of us that our lives have been messed up. And God invites you. He went to the cross to pay for your sin, and he says, you come to me and place your faith in me and what I did for you on the cross, and you trust me and invite me to come in to be your Lord and Savior and trust in me and what I did for you, not in your goodness, but in my righteousness. He says, I will come and I will give you life. That's that spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And he'll set you free from the law of sin and death. He invites you to come to him today and begin this journey.